Hi, I'm Andy Karam, and I'm going to be talking for the next several minutes about radiation safety at medical and healthcare organizations. What I'm going to talk about during this video are first some of the fundamentals of radiation safety, what the different types of radiation are, what their properties are, and how they can affect you. I'll also be talking about things like what happens if you get a high radiation dose in a short period of time or acute radiation exposure, as well as the longer term risks of developing cancer from exposure to diagnostic or therapeutic radiation. Next, I'll be talking about some of the concerns and some of the good work practices in the different medical departments that use radiation. So radiology, radiation oncology, and nuclear medicine. Finally, I'll be talking about how we can address radiological accidents or incidents such as spills or skin contamination, and then we'll summarize everything up to make sure that everybody remembers everything. Okay, before we get started on any of that stuff though, we should probably talk about where in a hospital radiation is used. Most of these are fairly obvious, some are not. For example, in x-ray, we have fluoroscopy machines which can give a fairly high dose rate, and in fact, fluoroscopy machines are one of the few ways that you can really hurt somebody with radiation by delivering enough dose to give skin burns. You've also got your x-ray machines and your CT scanners as well, but fluoroscopy really is what warrants the highest level of concern or the highest degree of control. Nuclear medicine is the only place in the hospital where people work with loose radioactive materials, with radioactive materials that are not confined in a welded source, but that can actually spread around and cause contamination. Those, of course, are administered to people to diagnose disease or to help to treat some diseases, but there's a higher degree of risk in nuclear medicine just because the radioactive material is unsealed and it can cause contamination or it can be ingested or inhaled. Radiation oncology probably has the most dangerous sources of radiation, whether that's a linear accelerator or a cobalt therapy source that's used to give external beam therapy. Luckily, however, radiation oncology has very stringent controls on how these sources of radiation are used and they also control their radioactive sources very closely so that people cannot be exposed, or at least so that they're less likely to be exposed to damaging levels of radiation. In addition to those, a lot of hospital laboratories will also use minor amounts of radioactivity in the form of radioimmunoassays that they use to help to detect disease. The first ones that I mentioned, radiology, nuclear medicine, radiation oncology, are the biggest ones that most people think about but you also have to realize that if your hospital is using what are called RIA kits, the radioimmunoassay kits, then you could also be exposed to some level of radiation or contamination in the laboratory setting. Before we get too much into what happens in each of the medical departments, Let's go back a bit and talk about some of the radiation safety fundamentals because these are important as far as understanding how to protect yourself against radiation as well as understanding what it can do. First, there are three primary types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. We're not going to talk about alpha radiation because you're just not likely to see that in a medical setting. Suffice it to say that alpha radiation internally can be quite damaging. Externally, it's not damaging at all. Beta radiation is something that you might see in some of the therapeutic radionuclides, such as strontium-90, yttrium-90, or iodine-131 gives off some beta radiation. Beta particles are very light, they have a modest electrical charge, and they can only penetrate about a half inch into skin. So if you're exposed to beta radiation externally, it can give you a dose to your skin, but you can't get internal dose, you can't get dose to your stomach, your liver, or any of your internal organs, from external exposure to beta radiation. It just will not penetrate far enough into the body to affect any of your internal organs. So with beta radiation, the biggest thing to remember is that if you get any on your skin to wash it off and, well, to try to avoid eating it or drinking it, you, as long as you don't get any internally, you should be all right. Gamma radiation is a different story. 
gamma rays are electromagnetic waves just like x-rays. They are very high energy, but they do penetrate through the whole body. If you're exposed to x-ray or gamma radiation, whether it's from a fluoroscope, a linear accelerator, or from a therapy source, that will give radiation dose to your internal organs as well as to your skin. So gamma radiation can be a hazard even if, you're, even if you do not ingest or inhale it. The best way to shield yourself from beta radiation is to use plastic. That minimizes the radiation dose as long as the plastic is a half inch thick or so. With gamma radiation, the best way to protect yourself against it is either to put the source of gamma radiation behind some lead, and typically these are called lead pigs or lead shields, or to just be as far away from the source of radiation as possible. I'll talk in a little while about the principles of time, distance, and shielding, which really work the best with X-ray and gamma radiation. Okay, so those are the different types of radiation. Let's talk a little bit now about the biological effects or the medical effects of exposure to these types of radiation. And there are two categories of these medical effects. If you're exposed to a lot of radiation in a short period of time, you can suffer what are called acute radiation exposure or what are, they're also called deterministic effects. This would be, for example, if you have a patient who's going through the cardiac catheterization lab, they may get a lot of fluoroscopy. And fluoroscopy is a high dose and high dose rate procedure if you, have, if you expose a patient to the fluoroscope beam for too long, they can start to develop skin burns. And in some cases, those burns can go fairly deep into the body. That's one form of acute radiation effect. And in fact, that's probably the most common f form of radiation injury in a medical setting is overuse of fluoroscopy leading to skin burns. At a dose of about 200 to 300 rads to the body, the skin will start to burn when you get to higher doses, you can even start to kill the tissue, or you can have peeling, blistering, loss of hair, and other effects. Medical staff are not going to see these effects, but the patients can, and there are actually some fairly well-known pictures of patients who have literally have had holes burned in their backs due to excessive use of fluoroscopy. The moral of the story is that you should not overexpose the patients to x-rays during a fluoro procedure, those are the most important ones or the ones most likely to cause harm. Other acute effects include things like cataract formation. If you get a high dose of radiation to the lens of the eye, about 200 to 300 rads, then you'll start to develop cataracts. If you expose your whole body to radiation, you can also see things like maybe chromosomal damage, a de depletion of red and white blood cells, radiation sickness, and all those happen before you get to about 100 rads worth of exposure. When you get to even higher levels of whole body radiation exposure, on the order of maybe 500 rads and higher, you can even kill a patient or you can receive a lethal dose of radiation. At the lower end of that, say 400 to 500 rads, what's happening is the immune system is being compromised. So the patients are dying from normally infectious disease, such as pneumonia. When you get to higher levels of radiation exposure, like 700, 800 rads and higher, the radiation is directly responsible for the deaths because the patients are dying of single or multiple organ failure. It's important to remember that this is what happens when the whole body is exposed to a dose of radiation in a short period of time. There are some therapies in which the patient will be exposed to maybe a thousand rads, but that's over the course of a couple of weeks. When there's an interval between these levels of radiation exposure, the body has a chance to repair the damage so being exposed to a thousand rads over the course of a month is not going to kill somebody. They may get sick from a radiation sickness, but they will not be dying of the radiation exposure as they would if they got that dose all at once. The second form of radiation exposure is chronic radiation exposure. And this is what you as a medical physicist, nuclear medicine technologist, radiologist, this is what you're going to be exposed to working in a medical setting. Chronic radiation exposure may give you cancer later on in life. It's the result of basically years and years of exposure to low doses of radiation. To be honest with you, we don't know exactly what happens at the lowest levels of radiation exposure. If your lifetime radiation exposure is less than about 10 rem or so, we really can't say whether or not you have an elevated risk of getting cancer. Some people think that you do, some people think that you don't. The most limiting way to predict cancer risk is called linear no threshold. 
linear no threshold basically postulates that any level 